verses 1 to 8. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you, the worship team as well, uh, leading us in worship. That's a blessing. Now we just read from uh, the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 15, and uh, you know the context of that chapter, uh, we had just seen Jesus uh, having the Last Supper uh, with his disciples, and after the Last, last Supper, Am I okay? Sorry, okay. Uh, after the Last Supper, now he is on his way. And we know that on that way, he's heading towards Getna. And uh, we know that he has also talked about being betrayed, that he, he is going to die, that the Son of Man was no longer going to be with them in a little while, and he is now heading toward Gethsemane. And we know in Gethsemane that when he prays that, Father, if it were possible, let this cup pass. Yet let, let it not be my will, but your will, while he's in Gethsemane. And we know soon after he is betrayed and he is now on his way uh, to be crucified. So he's having this discourse, uh, which is quite, may seem quite plain and simple, but quite interesting uh, in that he chooses to use uh, what we call uh, allegory or a story that has got a deeper meaning picture that has got a deeper meaning. So it is a story, he is talking, but it's got a lot of meaning in it, if we look at that in context. So he starts off by saying, I am the true vine, referring to himself. And what we hear in the Old Testament, we hear about the vine in the Old Testament. So Israel is referred to as the vine. Uh, as we read throughout the Old Testament, you go to Psalm 80, you hear about uh, Israel again being referred as the vine, and we hear that we know the story of the vineyard uh, in Isaiah chapter 5. Uh, we look at the story uh, of the vineyard in Isaiah chapter 5. Uh, in, that, in that story, we hear about that God planted a vineyard. And it started spreading forth among the mountains, took uh, Israel out of Egypt, took Egypt to the land of Canaan, and the vineyard started spreading all over. But then people started coming and plucking off. People coming and plucking off. <coughs> so here is a cry. The prophet Isaiah saying, Restore us, O God, again. Restore us. Look at that vineyard that was flourishing. 
Now there is trouble from all over. What had caused this trouble is rebellion. Obviously, the nation of Israel had rebelled or constantly rebelled against God, and that opened a door to the affliction of the enemy. Many other nations that we know that arose as enemies of Israel, like the Philistines and the Amalekites, they all rose up uh, you know, to fight against Egypt. But doors were opened uh, because of sin. Now Jesus is saying, I am the true vine. And uh, we often say that when you are looking at the Old Testament, it is actually the New Testament that is concealed. So which means in the Old Testament, the New Testament is still concealed. But when you go to the New Testament, it's now that Old Testament revealed. So now we are seeing Christ revealed in the Old Testament. And he's saying that vine that you used to talk about in the Old Testament, now I am the fulfillment of that. I am the true vine. So he's saying I am the source of everything. And those of us who know maybe in that context, in that culture, when vineyards were growing, they were not growing, they were not like trees going up, but they were spread on the surface. So as they were spreading on the surface, it means they were sub subject to the attacks of uh, different, uh, different things, the elements, the weather, attacks of uh, dust and everything. So what the vine dresser, who is the father, would do, so he's saying my father is the vine dresser, which means he is the husbandman, he is the gardener. His responsibility is to nurture the vineyard. So you look at those vines spreading and you lift them up, elevate them, set them up so that they are exposed to the sun. Move some of the leaves and everything to make sure that they grow and produce much fruit. So he's saying, I am the true vine, which means there are other vines that are not true vines. Mm -hmm. We know the story of a vine, a man planted his vine, and instead of that vine producing good fruit, it produced sour grapes. So Jesus is saying, I'm not like those false vines. I'm not like those deceptive vines. But I am the true one. I am the righteousness of God. And in me, you've got everything. In me, everything and anything that you want, you find it in me. I am the true vine. So he's saying, listen to these words. These are my last words. Very last conversation is having in a deeper context with his disciples. And we know that in context in different cultures, people value the way that somebody says before they die. Before they die, some, some, somebody could be almost on the deathbed, they're about to go in hospital, they say, okay, now, please, I want my family to come. And even the nurses know that the family has to be invited to come over to hear the last words. And the person will give instructions. That's when sometimes confessions are made. That way in some, in, in some cases, uh, revelations of things that were not known to others are made because the person is dying. And he's saying these words are very important. Please take hold of them. So this is what Jesus is saying to them. Listen, this is important to you. This is essential. I am the true vine. I'm not pointing into another, I'm not pointing to, a, to, to other deceivers like we have been learning lately about false prophets, false teachers arising. He's saying there's all that, but I am the true vine. So you depend upon me. I am, he said, the way, the truth, and the life, and no one goes to the Father except through me. So I am that way to the Father. And then he says, my father is the husband, which means God is the gardener. Again, like I was saying, it's, it's an allegory. 
it is a picture that painted that God's responsibility here to nature believers is to nurture you, is to look after you, to take care of you, to make sure you are not bruised, to make sure there's, there, there's nothing that's hurting and tormenting you, you are not hurt by disease, just like this vine. If they were spreading on the surface, they were subject to disease. They were subject to attack from insects. They were subject to attacks from uh, parasites. Subject to attack to, from you know the weather and anything, dust and everything. But they have to be lifted up. Now, he then talks when we start from verse 2, there are two branches that I want you to take note of as we talk. Um, two branches there is a branch that produces fruit, and there is a branch that does not produce fruit. So he says, every branch in me, remember, he's not saying, just saying every branch, he said every branch that is in me, every branch that is in me. In this context, we are talking about believers. We are in Christ. But while we are in Christ, we are not all the same uh, in the kingdom. There are some who are producing fruit, there are some who are producing much fruit, there are some who are not producing fruit. But God's idea is not to abandon completely those who are not producing fruit. But his desire is that they are nurtured so that they can also produce fruit. They are nurtured so that they can produce much fruit. So he's saying every branch that does not bear fruit, what does the Father there do? He takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it. So every branch that does not bear fruit, the Father takes that away. And then the one that is producing fruit, he purges it. And to purge here, yeah, it means to cleanse, to purify it. He makes it better so that it can produce more fruit. It is God's agenda that as believers we must be producing fruit. We must be producing fruit. We hear about the fruit of the spirit. We hear about uh, any animal, any creature must produce after its kind. So if we are believers, we must be producing or reproducing other believers. We must be showing the fruit of the spirit the fruit of love, the fruit of joy, the fruit of kindness. Every branch that is in Christ must produce after its kind, which means we must produce after Christ. Christ. Christ has called you so that you produce fruit. Remember in the Old Testament, in the beginning in Genesis, God says, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So it is not God's desire or plan that we just become believers and we become fruitless believers. God wants you to produce fruit. Fruit that will remain. And the world will know that you are my disciples, so Jesus says, if you have good love one for another. So one of the fruit of the Spirit which is essential is love. It is kindness. It is joy. It is self-control. So people will know that these are the disciples of Jesus when they produce fruit, produce much fruit. This is God's desire. Every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it brings forth more fruit. So it means even if you are producing fruit today, God wants you to produce even more fruit. So you purge you, you cleanse you. Some of the cleansing process may be painful. Believe me. When he's cleansing and purifying you, it may be painful because he's removing some impurities. In the culture, they used to take buckets and buckets of water, go to the grapes and start spraying them so that they are cleansing, they are taking, uh, removing all the dust mites, they are removing all the dirt that has been gathered during bad weather. They are making sure that the, the, the branches are flourishing. So in like manner for you, when God is cleansing you, it means some things that you may think or have become part of you that are not acceptable in the sight of God are removed. And as that is happening, it can be painful. 
it can be a painful process. You are used to that habit which is not acceptable in the sight of God. So when God is purging you and purifying you, he's getting rid of that habit. But it takes you to cooperate with God by abiding in him, by remaining in him. So that is, he's purging you. His desire is not to destroy you, but for you to become more fruitful, more effective in the place where God has called you. God wants you to be effective, wants you to subdue nations, wants you to take over, wants you to do things that you have been called to do. He wants you to, to, to bring the world into the kingdom. He wants you to influence your environment. So to do that, he has to remove some undesirables. It means sometimes for some of us, it means you have to be removed from your associations. Because the Bible says friendship with the world is enmity with God. It means sometimes you have to be removed from your comfort zone. So when he's talking about you abiding in Christ, it means that about you being removed from things that you are familiar with, that you are comfortable with, so that God can accomplish his purpose in you. I'm just praying that the Lord continues to minister to us and we can see things that do not please God and begin to walk away, begin to allow the Holy Spirit to minister to us, to change us, to transform us. The whole purpose of us becoming believers is transformation, is change. Because we were all aliens, we were all foreigners from the commonwealth of Israel. We were all sinners, lost, we were going astray, we were all destined to die. But we have now been drawn near by the blood of Jesus. And because we've been brought into the kingdom, we've been translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, what needs to happen is we need to leave everything that's to do with the kingdom of darkness and now adopt our new identity in Christ Jesus. The Bible says we've been adopted into the family of God. So if you've been adopted, it means with my surname, which is quite lengthy, which is Mzingwa, if I'm adopted into the Moli family, I become a Moli. <laughs> I, I have to forget about my, my, my surname. It's no longer my surname. That's no longer my identity. I've got a new identity that I now assume because I've been adopted. I now become a son. And I, I, I now deserve all, you know, the rights of a son. I almost like when I'm talking about these issues, I talk about things that I've gone through, which I know, uh, you know. When I became a British citizen, I was not a British citizen, I was a Zimbabwean citizen, but then I became a British citizen. By becoming a British citizen, it means my citizenship, new citizenship, I now have the rights I now have access, I now have the benefits of British citizenship. When I'm asked about my, my citizenship, I say, I'm British. If you go, those of you who, who travel about, you go to the airport, you're traveling, there are two queues. There's a queue for the British citizen, there's a queue for other people, which is a lot longer, right? So if you are queuing up as a British citizen, then you are going and you go to the passage is a lot easier than, than the other I've gone through all that process. So I'm saying now we are citizens of heaven. We have been adopted into Christ. So which means we have got the same rights. And the Bible says we are seated together with Christ in the heavenly places. Positionally, this is where you are, seated together with Christ. We are saying I am the true vine in the heavenly places, far above all principalities, all powers, all dominion, all sickness, all disease, all worries, all anxieties. That's where we are seated right now, spiritually. So that's where you are. You've been adopted. And the Bible also says we have been grafted into Christ. The process of grafting is taking a branch that is a branch of a different tree and it is grafted into 
another tree and it starts now to gain the identity of that tree where it has been grafted in. So this is what has happened to us. We begin to get all the nutrients. We begin to get all the energy, the benefits of Christ because he is the true vine. And he's saying every branch, so in other words, the branch that's in him, that bears fruit, the father is going to look at that branch and is going to prune it, nature it, so that it bears much fruit. That's God's intention. And that's God's plan for you, that you bear more fruit. And he's saying you are clean through the word which I've spoken to you. Through the word that has been spoken by Jesus, we have been cleansed by that word. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Him alone. And then he says, now you want to abide in me. Which means if you are abiding, it's not just a question of you visiting. It's not just a question of you, you know, sometimes going or just looking at a place. But it means you are dwelling in there. Abide in me. You are becoming one with that. He says, abide in me. Don't abide in other places that are temporary. Because other places are temporary. They are powerless. They are weak. Jesus has no weakness. He's the one who has conquered death we're singing here. He's the one who has overcome everything. He was tempted in every way. And yet he came out without sin. He has overcome death. He has overcome anything that may try to subdue you. So he's saying now, abide in me. Remain in me. That's what other versions say. Abide in me and I in you. And he's saying, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you except in a, you abide in me. So in other words, he's saying, if you are not in me, if you are not in Christ, we cannot bear fruit by ourselves. We can try as much as we want. If you got Psalm 127, you know, it talks about unless God builds a house, they labor in vain, then that build it. Unless God watches over a city, they watch in vain, then that watch over it. So in other words, if we are outside of God, we cannot accomplish anything of eternity. There is nothing that leads us to eternal life that we can accomplish outside of God. If we abide in him, we abide in Christ. We depend upon him for everything. This vine would depend, the branches would depend upon the vine. If a branch is attacked from the vine, it cannot bear fruit by itself. It withers and wilts away and it is destroyed into the fire. But if the branch continues being attached and fully attached to the vine, it means it's gaining all the nutrients, all the energy it's getting from that vine. And then it starts to produce fruit. So he's saying, abide in me. Remain in me. It can be difficult for believers to remain in Christ. I know there are challenges for us because the world is offering so much. The world has so many, so many solutions. The world is trying to lead you in another direction. If you, have go, if, if, if you have been attacked by an illness, you can easily go to, 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 to sister or brother Google and look for answers. If you are troubled, you can easily go to the internet and search for answers. If you have got anything that's challenging you, you can easily go for consultation. There is free consultation everywhere. There are some psychologists who are offering you solutions. There are some doctors who are offering you solutions. There are so many answers everywhere. But I can say to you this morning or this afternoon, true answer comes from the Lord. Not from anybody else. And true and real lasting solution comes from the Lord. You cannot depend on the arm of flesh. If you depend on the arm of flesh, it will just come to nothing at the end. So that's why he's saying, without me, you can do nothing. You cannot produce any fruit except from me. You cannot do anything without me. That's Jesus. 
He has called you by name. He has called you for a purpose at such a time as this. And he's saying, abide in me. All you need to do is to abide in me. Abiding in Christ, it means having confidence in him. It means having faith in him. It means depending upon him. It means you choosing, making a choice, which is called a volition. Volition, volition that's your choice, choosing to say, which way should I go? You make your decision, where should I go? And he's saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. And I said this, I said in, I, I, in Psalm 127, unless God builds the house, if it's your family, you go to Christ. If it's your health, you abide in Christ. Outside of me, you can't accomplish anything. If it's yourself feeling depressed and worried, feeling like you know there's nobody listening to you, Jesus is the answer. Without me, you cannot produce anything. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He repeats again. He who abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Without Jesus, we can do nothing. How many times have we tried to do things? How many times have we tried to come up with solutions and answers? How many times have you gone to somebody, uh, you know, with questions and they are quick to give you answers? Like that. But is it coming from the Lord? They are quick to tell you how to do things. They are quick to give you their own testimonies. But is it coming from the Lord? Without me, you can do nothing. I am the vine. And you are the branches. Every branch depends upon the vine for food, for nourishment. It depends upon the vine. And God the Father is watching over you every day. When you wake up in the morning, God is watching over you. When you are going out and about, God is watching over you to nurture you, to protect you. He's watching over you to provide for you. He's watching over you to ensure your needs are met. He's watching over you to direct your steps. Because the Bible says the steps of the righteous are the order of the Lord. It's God who orders your steps. It's God who has got the answer to everything. It's God who directs you. So in other words, if you are abiding in Christ, you are saying to God, which way should I go? You remember the story of David after he had gone to fight against the Amalekites and they'd come, they came back to Ziklag and they found that the camp had been destroyed. Their women and children had been taken away. And he comes back and he sees that this is a great warrior. You would expect him to react straight away and say, let's pursue the enemy. But the Bible says David strengthened himself in the Lord. And then he said to God, shall I pursue after these people? Will I overtake them? Will I recover everything? And the Lord says, pursue. And you overtake. And you are going to recover all. He had to wait upon God. The problem that we are having these days is that if people are very quick to react. People are very quick to act without consulting God. In that predicament, did you speak to God? Did you ask God for direction? Did you ask God for what to do, even if it looks so obvious? It's not always obvious with God. The Bible says your ways are not my ways. In other words, if God's thoughts are not your thoughts, his ways are not your ways. And he says even if the heavens are higher than the earth, so are his ways higher than your ways. So where it seems so obvious that this is the way to go, we always need to consult God. Don't wait to consult God when things are difficult. Even if things look so straightforward, consult him. But he's saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. Yes, I know people are doing things, but when he's saying you can do nothing, he means you can do nothing of eternity. That leads to eternal life that will last for eternity. What you can do could be things that are temporary, that pass away, but apart from him, 
we can do nothing that will add eternal value to you. We can only depend upon the vine. Depend upon him. So it's from today, looking at yourself, looking at your life, sometimes there are times when we have felt like abandoned and all alone. We have felt like there's nobody who is listening to me. There's nobody who is coming to support me. Jesus, the true vine, is saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can't function. Apart from me, you cannot achieve anything. If a man abides in me, he is cast forth as a branch. If a man abides not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire. If you abide in me and my word, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. If we do not abide in Christ as believers, Today, as believers, there are two types of the believers all the time. Believers, we have made choices and decisions. God has given you still the power to choose. Right from the beginning, you are given the power to choose. To choose life or death. To choose to become a believer or not a believer. To choose Christ or not Christ. And then we have chosen, I believe, we have all chosen to follow Christ. But again, within the church, we've got other believers who choose not to move any further than the decision they made to follow Christ. Then we've got the believers who make a choice to move closer and closer to God. Remember, as soon as you become a Christian, the Bible says, if any man is in Christ, is a new creation. Behold, the old is passed away and the new has come. You are a new creation, but as a new creation, you have to become more and more like Jesus every day. You have to be sanctified by the word of God. Allow the word of God to sanctify you, change you, cleanse you every day. That's the way you become more and more like Jesus. Having the word of God every day, every day, every day, eating upon the word of God, spending time in prayer, spending time in fellowship, spending time hearing from the Lord, spending time communing with the Holy Spirit. That's the way God transforms you. So every branch that abides not in me. So if this branch is not abiding in Christ, it means it's depending, it's abiding in other things. It's not abiding in Christ, not remaining in Christ. This is the reason why it withers away. Because I say the branch that's in Christ get all the nutrients, all the energy from Jesus or from the tree. But if it comes off the tree, then it means it withers. It starts wilting away. Discouragement will come and people will start overthinking things. Uh, sicknesses will come and people will start overthinking things and will start gravitating more and more towards other sol solutions, but not Christ. We've got a lot of uh, spiritualists these days, uh, not just in the African context, but in, 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 well, in, in the whole world, spiritualists who are coming up with answers. Some psychics coming up with answers and solutions. They post something on your, I think I saw a day, I saw something from a psychic posted. To, I said, where is this coming from? And uh, he is inviting you to be a friend on Facebook. Sorry. Don't just accept all invitations without knowing where that's coming from. I read the profile of this man and I said, wow. He starts off by telling you he'll give you all the wealth, he's got all the answers and everything, so now come and join me. The moment you do that, you are actually an active participant and you are joined together with that person. And we are inviting attacks from the enemy. A door has been opened. So the enemy has got a right to come and attack you. Because they've opened that door. Be careful with your social media. Be careful with things that you come across. You can easily drift away. When you start believing in other things, 
I know everybody is pursuing after wealth, is pursuing after material things. So the enemy knows that and he uses that door to invite a lot of people so that you become corrupted. Once you become corrupted, it then becomes difficult for you to remain in the vine, to remain in the word of God. And I'm here to say to you this morning that Jesus is the answer to everything. There are many, 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 many doctors. There are many, many, many people who know things. But Jesus is the answer to everything. He's created everything. He is the Prince of Peace. He is your righteousness. He is the one who, is, who can provide for you. When we are talking about Jehovah Jireh, we are talking about him. That he is the only one who is the source of everything. That's why he's saying, I am the true vine. Which means there are the counterfeit vines that try to imitate him, that try to emulate him, that try to come like him. But you need to know who he is. Do you know your God? Do you have a relationship with him? Do you know him? Do you know what he can do for you? Do you depend upon you, upon him? Do you remain in him? all the time, consistently, and making sure I do not open doors to the enemy. <clears throat> because the enemy is looking for doors to come and attack. <clears throat> He's looking for ways to come and manipulate you. He's looking for ways to come and mislead you. He's looking for ways to come and distract you. But he is saying, I am the true vine. And without me, you cannot do anything. If you abide in me, you shall ask what you will. So in other words, this is a promise that we are having here. That if we abide in him, we remain in him. You shall ask for anything. Anything that you ask for, if you abide in Christ, and it shall be done unto, uh, unto you. If you abide in him, you shall ask for anything, and it shall be done to you. So in other words, if we are asking for anything according to his will, it will be done to you because you are abiding in him. What's more important that God is talking about is the relationship with you. That your relationship has got to be a sustained relationship. If you go like this, you go to Psalm 91, when, when he's talking about he who dwells in the secret place. He's talking about somebody who dwells in that secret place, in his presence. So abiding and remaining in Christ is essential in these days, particularly now when we are living in the last of the last days. There is so much deception that's moving and creeping in right now. In the communities you live, there is so much deception. In the society you live, there is so much deception. When you go on the internet, don't just read anything. Like I was saying, don't just listen to anybody, right? There are some people who are deceivers and they are speaking things that can lead you astray. You've got to remain in Christ and in the doctrine of Jesus Christ. The pure, undiluted gospel of Jesus Christ without digressing from the truth. Because there are some people who have come in who are called by the Bible they are called wolves in sheep's clothing. They come and tell you things that you want to hear. Things that your itching ears want to hear. And they'll come and give you promises that you want to hear. Some of them, they ask you to give money so that you can get this. I was listening to one of them and I said I attended a conference. It was a training for ministry conference. Yes, I, years ago, I think that's maybe about 15 years ago or so, I attended the training for ministry conference. And this man was speaking, as he was speaking, he said, everybody here who wants their debt to be cancelled, I want you to come up and give a thousand pounds. And <laughs> if, if you don't have a thousand pounds, right, if you don't have a thousand pounds, we accept direct debit. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and you can bring your credit cards 
and pray this 1,000 pounds. And he said, I want a hundred people to come up. Right? And a lot of people stood up. I, I could almost count the maybe maybe 500 or something. He never said, oh, that's 100, that's a cutoff. No, he accepted everybody. And people started, you know, giving some, giving away credit cards and everything. And, he, you know, because who doesn't want to be that free? You know, and he was making these huge promises. Years later, I hear him, and he's saying, oh, now God has revealed to me that what I was doing was wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, all the, that I was calling people to come and give a thousand pounds and everything, that was wrong. And I'm saying, okay, that was wrong. Why don't you say all that money that you collected, <laughs> I'm now giving it back <laughs> to the poor. That's not happening. What am I saying? The spirit of deception has crept in the church because of the desperation of people, because people do not want to abide in Christ and depend on Christ. Because we are not just getting things because we, you know, we pray maybe once a week and, and something. There's much more than bread and butter. There, there, there's much more than silver and gold in Christ. It's a relationship with Christ. A relationship of transformation, a relationship of change, a relationship that leads to eternity, more than the food that we eat. That's why Jesus said, do not worry about what we eat or drink. Do not worry about clothing. Because life is much more than food and drink. It's much more than clothing. Abide in him. You shall ask for anything, and it shall be done for you. And here is my father, here in is my father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. Say God is glorified that you bear much fruit. He is glorified as you produce more fruit. And the world is beginning to see that you are my disciples as you show love one for another. The love of God has been shed abroad. And what God expects us as believers is to be demonstrating this love one for another. The Bible says, how can you say you love God? You cannot see when you cannot love a brother that you see on a daily basis. And the love that I'm talking about here is not just love by words alone, but it's love that's demonstrated by action, it's love that comes from the heart. When you are saying to somebody, I love you, you genuinely mean it. I've heard some believers who have told me they really struggle to love. The Bible says, greater love is no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his brethren. This is what Jesus did because of love. He went on that cross because of his love for you and I. <coughs> He hung on that cross because of his love for you. He saw you in your desperation. He saw you without hope. He saw you, you know, tainted by sin, corrupted by sin, destined for hell. And he gave his life for you. Greater love has no man than this. There is nobody. And the Bible says, someone can die for somebody who is good. They can easily die for someone who is a great. They can say, oh, I will, I will die for you. I will protect you. I will die for you. But for people who are destined for hell, tainted by sin, he died for the sins that you committed in the past, sins that are being committed today, sins that will be committed in the future. And Jesus was carrying all that sin. He was carrying the sin of the world on that cross, separated from the Father. For that period, there was darkness that came upon the earth for those three hours because he was carrying sin. And we hear him crying on the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabakita, 
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because in that moment, the father could not countenance his son because he was carrying the sin of the world. And we know God is holy. He could not countenance his son for that moment. So he was saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? It was painful and unnatural for him to be carrying the sin of the world. When he had lived here on earth and without sin, but he was carrying your sin and my sin. Some people say they can't love somebody because that person is not walking right with God. That's where we need to be demonstrating the love of Christ. Because Jesus has done much more. That's where we need to be showing that we, we are believers. We are children of the Most High God. We are branches that are producing fruit. Somebody is one, maybe just by love. They can see that love. There are some who have never experienced love in their lives. Not even from parents, not from siblings, not from teachers. All they know is to be jeered and abandoned and loved it. That's all they know. And they've not seen any love. But a branch that's producing fruit here is going to be showing the fruit of spirit, the spirit, the fruit of love. And accepting. And love that keeps no record of wrong. I think husbands and wives will be debating on this all the time. Love keeps no record of wrong. Which means if I wronged you last year, you can't be reminding me today that last year you did the same thing. But love should not keep any record of wrong. If I did wrong last year, then you, because of love, you should have forgotten and buried this. It's a hard one, isn't it? <laughs> right, so it keeps no record of wrong. That's love. I just want us to, to pray today. Thank you, Lord. I just want us to pray. Jesus is saying, abide in me. If you abide in me and my words abide in me, in you, you shall ask for anything. I just want you to do a searching of yourself. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit just to search you, search you, and see where you are at. But I want to reassure you that God is the husbandman. He is the gardener. He is the vine dresser. He wants to dress you. He wants to lift you up. He doesn't want to leave you right on the ground, exposed to the elements, exposed to the dust, to the mind and everything, but he wants to lift you up. And he wants to nurture you. He wants to cultivate you. He wants to cleanse you. The washing of water by the word. He wants to cleanse you and purify you. And today we just want to, I believe this is one of the most the greatest moment. Just think about what Jesus has done for you. Think about what Jesus did for you on the cross of Calvary. And today, just pour yourself out. Just like we're singing, coming back to the heart of worship. And that is all about you, Jesus. It's all about him. Just surrender all to him and say, Lord, just help me, cleanse me. Areas that you are struggling, give them over to Jesus and say, Lord, I surrender all to you. I surrender my life. I surrender my weaknesses, my struggles. I surrender everything to you, Lord. Change me, transform me. Wash me by your blood. We thank you, mighty Father. Oh, we give you praise, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, my God. Thank you for greater love than this. Hmm. That a man laid down his life for his brethren. And today we thank you for your son Jesus. We thank you for the finished work of Calvary. We thank you Lord that you are the true vine. And God the Father is the husbandman. And today we realize that without you Lord we can do nothing. And we are surrendering everything to you Lord. We have tried in our efforts. We have tried to do things without you. But oh God we pray that you help us today. Help us to give everything to you, Lord. Help us to surrender all to you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we give you praise, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
We just want to pray for those of, those of you who need prayer. Just be challenged. Give all to Jesus. Give all to Jesus. Give everything to Jesus. Your pride, your abilities, where you've relied on the arm of flesh, give it all to Jesus and say, just say, Jesus, just take over my life. Take over everything. My thought process. Take over my situation. Change me. Transform me. Wash me by your blood. If you've got any sickness in your body, if you've got anything that's challenging you and you need prayer, just come. We'll pray together. God bless you.